Cool. One thing that really caught my attention because I'm like a big supplement person. Well, Anybody I'm curious. What do you it? take? This is cool. Well, okay, okay. So let's go through it. And you know what? I'm gonna bring it out. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Cool. I like this. I literally have like eight or nine. Wow. Okay. Mix these. So you have a lot of supplements. I have a lot, man, and I spend a lot of money. So I'm like, all right, Doctor Mike, <laughs> can you save me? $150 a month because this is getting ridiculous. Well, folks, it's time to kick it old school. Uh, so you can feel cool. <laughs> Give it to me, baby. <laughs> baby. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Growth Mind. Today we have a very special guest. His name is Dr. Mike wearing his uniform as well, all prepped up. <laughs> I love the logo, by the yeah, way. Yeah, thank you so. Thanks so much for having me, Sean. I very much appreciate it. Yeah, this logo, uh, it actually happened right in the beginning of the YouTube channel because we wanted it as something catchy that brought the medical side of things, but also kept it fun and light. And I think it really strikes that really good balance that we have on the channel of entertainment and education. In the form of edutainment, that's sort of our uh, <laughs> content strategy. I love it. Are you selling this merch to other doctors or other people that are in the medical field or just anyone that just wants to wear it online? Uh, I've sold merch in the past for fundraisers, uh, like throughout COVID, uh, we wanted to raise money for the CDC Foundation. We did this mm -hmm. whole uh, video where we interviewed over 100 doctors. And for that, I created a shirt with my slogan that said, stay alert, not anxious, with this logo on it. And they sold out really quickly. So wow. <laughs> it's great to see people have a, a hunger for it. And I'm glad we're able to raise money. I think we raised like $100,000 for the CDC Foundation. Holy crap. Congrats. <laughs> thank you. Thank great you. Great work. Well, I'm really excited to have you on. Mostly, you know, because of the work that you're doing, but particularly just because I have a special bond with immigrants that have come in from a different country into U.S. or Canada, in my case. And there's like a specific experience that we've had obviously of needing to learn english and all these different things that happen i know you came when you were six years old right all the way from russia yeah i came from russia when i was six years old didn't speak the language my parents didn't speak the language definitely a tough journey being an immigrant but at the same time it really does prepare you to be flexible adaptable ready to learn always with a really strong work ethic. And that's why I think America has been really the place where immigrants have thrived when they come with this really strong passion of wanting to succeed. And I think that's what makes it different from, as an example, the country that I left, where that sort of rise in not only financial status, but also in success was very difficult. Like where you were born, that's sort of where you're capped off based on your religion, other factors really play a role in where you where and what, what you can achieve in life. So I'm really grateful to have grown up here in America. That's why my father, even though he was a physician back in Russia, took my whole family out of Russia, brought us here to the United States, learned English, went to medical school all over again, residency all over again in his 40s. Like I can't even wow. imagine in 10 years what would make me leave America and do that in another country with another language. But clearly, uh, not only was it meaningful for him to do that? But the results have really spoken for themselves with the success my sister and I have found here in the United States. That's insane. So none of the credentials or the experience that he had back in Russia were validated here in the United States. So he had to literally go through the whole process over again. Yep. He went through actually the same medical school that I went to in New York College of Osteopathic Medicine. Now it's New York Institute of Technology College of Osteopathic Medicine. And he did this foreign immigrate program where foreign doctors were allowed in. And I think they shaved a year off of their training. So instead of doing four years medical school, three years residency, it was three years of medical school, three years residency. So it's still six years yeah. of taking on loans, being broke, having my mom have to sweep floors for $5 an hour when she has a PhD in mathematics. But it's that classic immigrant story where we set a goal and we were going to do everything in our power from a personal responsibility standpoint to make sure we achieve that goal. That's insane, man. And I know that because I've, I've traveled around South America and I know that it's not the same type of salary that you would get here in the US as a physician back in uh, other other countries. I'm not sure exactly what it was like in Russia, but I, I imagine it wasn't like the currency just 
suddenly transferred over and, and he had a lot of money to be able to spend on medical school and everything. Like it was probably a very difficult time financially for you guys. Yeah. 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 We came really broke here and we essentially survived with the help of the government, you know, uh, part being on a welfare program and rent controlled subsidized housing. I mean, we lived four people in a one bedroom apartment. Our computer was in our kitchen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my sister and I shared a bedroom and my parents slept in the living room. So it was tiny, uh, but that $500 a month really meant something to us. So we had shelter, we had food, um, you know, everything that we needed was accounted for. And then the last factor for success was our work ethic. And once we put that in, you mix it in, give it some time. And that's what really completed the formula. Man, so can you recall what it was like for you when you first, because six, you can still recall a few things. Like I came here when I was seven. So I'm still able to remember a few things here and there. What was that experience like for you coming all the way from Russia, not knowing English, and then coming into a very different education system too, right? Like I remember learning like division and like multiplication when I was in six or seven. And then I come here and like, they're learning like <laughs> subtraction. They're like just yeah. getting into like, you know, addition and subtraction. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this is a piece of cake, you know? So what, what, <laughs> what was that no, like It's, for it's you? funny that you say that. I, I feel like that's a common uh, experience. And actually immigrant parents talk about that often, how you know, in other countries, we're quicker to educate our youth. Um, when I came, I was six years old. I went right away into first grade. Having that language barrier was definitely tough. I was angry at my parents for taking me away from my friends. We had to sort of keep it a secret that we were leaving Russia. You know, it was right towards the you know tail end of the communism era of USSR. Um, it was obviously Russia at that point, but there's still, you know, individuals who didn't enjoy when people left Russia for the United States. Wow. So we kept it quiet which therefore it was a surprise to me that we were leaving. I found out the day before probably. They didn't even tell you. Um, no, no, literally the day before it's like, pack your stuff. Let's go. We're leaving. And I'm like, where are we going? They're like, don't worry about it. <laughs> and then uh, we find out going to America. Uh, I'm mad, but also interested at the same time of where this journey is going to take us. I remember being on the plane and the flight attendant gave me these like little Delta wings, like a pin. And I always found it so cool because in Russia, you never got anything for free. And here, <laughs> like she was just giving me this away. And I was like, I don't have money. She's like, no money, no money. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. So it, 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 my first experience in America was a, a very pleasant one. Going into first grade was rough because not speaking the language, I was confused. Luckily, there were uh, some students in the class who spoke both Russian and English. Mm. And they helped translate for me, which was nice. Uh, I remember I walked into the classroom and the teacher asked me a question and I knew three words, yes, no, and maybe. So she asked me a question. I said, yes. She asked me another follow-up. I said, no. She gave me another one. I said, maybe. And that's when she realized I had no idea what I was talking about because she definitely did not ask a maybe type question. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was tough. But then when it came to like mathematics, especially with my mom being a, a mathematics professor in Russia, I, I was further ahead than my colleagues were. I even remember in, in high school, I was uh, in my sophomore year taking the same classes that the seniors were taking. And I finished calculus my junior year of high school. Like most people are taking calculus wow. in college. So uh, take, retaking calculus in college because my credits didn't transfer over was a breeze for me. And it gave me a lot of free time to do things on the side, like social media, meeting friends, that sort of thing. No kidding, man. And did you even know what America was at six years old coming in? Like your dad's no. telling you, yeah, we're going to the U. Did they even tell you that you go to the U.S.? Like that was a... You know, I don't remember if they specified. It was kind of because we went first from our small town to Moscow. We spent the night there with some friends. It, it was like a blur. You know, being at six years old, you're just going. You're going along for the journey. I just remember the day that they told me I was upset about it because they said, say goodbye mm. to your friends. And I was not happy about that. Mm. Um, so that was tough. But, you know, six years old, you're resilient. You bounce back rather quickly. You know, they gave me uh, one of those matchbox toys, cars when we landed and that's all I needed. I was happy. I, was sold. I love America. <laughs> you were sold then. Yeah. Same with me around Canada. I mean, I had, I wasn't really the one taking that much abuse, but my brother's three years old. And at that time it was like a culturally normally accepted thing around Korea to just like hit students, you know, and it yeah. was like a way to discipline them. Uh, and, and I'm laughing about it now because it's, it's something in the past, but it's, uh, it's, it's something where like we were almost like escaping at that point. And I was like, wow, so we're not going to get beat. 
I can do addition again, and it seems like uh, it seems like it's a pretty good deal so far. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. What do you think about it now? You know, looking back all these years later, do you do you see any benefit in the fact that you were so advanced and perhaps were disciplined harder or harsher? I think there? so. I think I think, and I'm, I'm I'm sure it goes the same to you. There's a certain level of work ethic. There's a certain level of needing to. Uh, prove not necessarily to your parents, but just to over like to understand that your parents work so hard to be able to get to uh, to get get you to where you have the freedom and the ability to really do anything you want, and it it's a constant reminder, certainly even to this day, uh, of just being able to work harder and harder. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And that's why you know seeing my dad go through this whole process when I was ten years old. Not many kids get to see their parents go through med school, so I was lucky and pretty much fortunate to be in the midst of all that. Uh, I got to see how hard he had to work, how much more difficult it was for him than for me in this type of scenario. So when I was struggling in med school, I knew I couldn't come home and complain that the test was hard mm. because he was doing it in a foreign language at 40 years old while taking care of two children. So I had no excuses, and <laughs> that really caused me to sort of to say, okay, complaining, whining here is not going to help. Because I'm only going to get a, you know, a really sarcastic joke back from my father if I tell him this. No and it's kidding. not because he's not supportive. It's just because he's like, look, I set the precedent for you. Use me as the example. And you know, I, I held that true to heart. That's amazing, man. Do you still speak a little bit of Russian? Oh, I speak fluently Russian. Fluent Russian. Wow. So f yeah. fluent Russian, fluent English. That's yeah, amazing. I know decent enough Spanish to get by with a lot of my Spanish-speaking patients, actually. Oh, amazing. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Damn. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit more about the process of how you started to document your journey. I mean, obviously, as coming in here as an immigrant, you, you had the work ethic, and I can totally resonate with the, the mindset that you had of being able to over overachieve and, and and really really show your parents that you know it wasn't it wasn't that they immigrated for nothing. And um, you obviously decided that you were going to go into medical school, and you started to document your journey. What was the origin and, 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 and the desire to put and document your journey on social media? Yeah, uh, I think there was a few factors that really combined together that created the perfect fertile ground for me to launch my social media career. That's obviously the fact that social media was hitting an all-time peak and I happened to be around at that time. I guess you could call me an early adopter of Instagram. Um, also the fact that I was in an interesting career path. A lot of people want to know about doctors. Uh, also doctors have a very, I guess, uh, stereotypical look in people's minds and I did not fit that mold. So I stood out, uh, at least on, on so social media platforms. What is the and look that people I, have? If, if you don't mind me asking. Well, that it would be immigrant doctors. Like if mm. you look at the way TV shows casted doctors before, unless they were Asian, Indian, it would be very rare unless you have a Grey's Anatomy stereotypically good-looking doctor, which everyone says, oh, that doesn't exist in real life. When in reality, it exists all the time. There's all sorts of races that are doctors. And, you know, it's it just one of those things that media keeps portraying the same racial bias over and over again. Just like you see with like IT, the same thing. And why we don't see enough, you know, female IT specialists or engineering specialists, because it, it's never been shown to them as a potential job, as having role models that they can model after. And I think as time goes on and we're going to see more diversity in these fields, we're going to see the younger generation start modeling themselves after those people. So I came in and no one expected that I was a doctor. Actually, a lot of my comments were, you're not really in med school. You're just pretending. Once I was a doctor, they were claiming I just like dress up as one. That, that feedback was plenty. Um, but I think another factor that is less talked about that I even probably don't mention as much is because I grew up so poor, but then lived in an area like New York City where I was surrounded by a lot of wealthy individuals. I was fortunate enough to meet some friends that took me to some unique parties, events, networking. I got to see both sides of the equation, you know, how the poor side lives where we, where we were on welfare, but also get to see how the really wealthy people live and how exorbitant their lifestyles are. And I saw that they didn't make them happy. So I really put a lot of my emphasis after seeing that on chasing my passion and the need and want to help other people. And that's why I saw family medicine, the type of specialty that I practice, the perfect fit for myself. 
you know, I had plenty of friends who were very wealthy business owners telling me, why are you going into the lowest paying or one of the lowest paying specialties in medicine? And I kept reminding them that it's not about money because if you just solely use that as your barometer for happiness, you're doomed for a really sad or unmeaningful life. And because of that, my passion for family medicine really shined on social media where I would go on and say, you know, on a TV show and they would be like, oh, you're the sexiest doctor alive or some superficial title that they give you. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, I'm really passionate about primary care for reason X, Y, and Z. And they're like, we never thought about it that way. And they asked me a follow-up question. I answered it well. And because that passion, the, the experience of not caring or chasing money, all of that really came together well, where I can be an effective marketer, but not chase the dollar signs, where I can be a good physician, but have the reach of you know, a million people when I give out a piece of advice, as opposed to the 20, 30 people I see in an exam room in a given day. So it really, like all these factors mesh together really well. And obviously combining that with the work ethic my parents instilled in me as immigrants, that really topped it off. Uh, and it's clear that you're really passionate about what you do. I mean, you're still practicing, obviously, uh, yeah. on, a, on, on a regular basis. And um, I, I've heard the story of like where you had to save someone's life on a, on a plane. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't go into it, but what's, what's the story there? Yeah, it's funny because, you know, I do these uh, medical drama reviews on my YouTube channel and they're quite popular, you know, like the Grey's Anatomy, House MDs of the world. And yeah, I had one of those moments happen on a plane where I'm taking a transcontinental flight. I get on the plane. I'm about to take a nap. And what do you know? They say, is there a doctor on board? I'm like, oh, you know, probably someone has a headache or something. Let me go see. And it turned out that a young gentleman was going into anaphylactic shock and his throat was closing up. And we're over the Atlantic Ocean, nowhere to land, no EpiPen on board, which was a huge issue. Oh. Um, and I had to sort of scatter and figure out what to do. Luckily, I broke open the kit, was able to find the same medication that's found in an uh, Epi auto injector like an EpiPen do a little dose calculation on the fly, which I had to do really quickly. And I was trying to do my best to make sure that I was calculating the dosage correctly. No Wi-Fi over the Atlantic Ocean. So um, luckily we figured it out, gave him the injection. It worked, his throat opened up. I monitored his vitals throughout the flight and he had a, a really good outcome. Actually enjoyed this, his trip completely as if nothing happened. When, you know, had I not been on board, who knows what would have happened. They would probably have to, you know, turn the plane around two hours back. Would his throat have closed? Who knows? It, it, it's a, it would have been a really bad situation. So. Was it was it too far to land in a nearby airport as well? Like it was really the only yeah, situation the, that when he had. it started happening, the pilot came out and told me the options that we could either go to the islands off Portugal, which would be like an hour and forty five minutes, or turn around and go back to Canada, would have been the nearest place to land two hours back, and asked if. I needed that to happen. And I said, well, give me five minutes. Let me figure out what to do with this medicine. And I figured it out, gave him the injection, monitored him, saw his throat opened up and said, we can continue on flying. And if anything changes, we could always divert once we get closer to land. But I monitored him again, every 15 minutes, blood pressure, pulse, talking to him, keeping him awake. And uh, again, it was really one of those like moments where you're like MacGyvering a kit <laughs> that is meant for, it was literally a, a cardiac crash kit. That was the medicine that I used. Wow. And that needle is thick. It's long. It's not meant to go into someone's thigh. Like the epi auto injectors are like these thin little needles that go right into the leg. No problem. This was thick. It was long. The medicine, we had to spill half of it on the floor because I couldn't see how much I was putting in. It was a mess, but luckily it was a great wow. outcome for uh, the gentleman. That's crazy. And was this when you were yeah. like the Dr. Mike that we know today? Or was this when you were just, yeah. just building this up? <laughs> this is last year. This is July. Yeah, it's not that long ago. Actually, oh one year God. ago. Oh my God, one year ago, probably like a few weeks ago. And did someone recognize you in the airplane? Like, That's Dr. Um, Mike. So it's funny. <laughs> part of being a good doctor in moments like that is keeping the patient calm. And usually the way to do that is to change the subject, to take them out of the current situation. Because something that was happening to him as a result of a side effect of the epinephrine, which is essentially adrenaline, was his throat was starting to get dry. And he couldn't figure out, and he was getting a lot of anxiety, whether or not his throat was closing up again, or was it just dry, like when you're about to make a speech, you know, public speaking, your throat gets dry from the adrenaline. And I kept checking and telling him and reassuring him, but clearly his anxiety was hitting a peak. So to calm him down, I said, by the way, 
uh, you know, it's pretty funny. I do these medical drama reviews and I started sharing all my social media stuff. And right away he got so excited. Mm. He started asking me questions. Uh, what's it like to have, you know, millions of followers and it completely distracted him. It took him out of the stress of that moment. And I think it helped him because, uh, you know, it's scary. It's scary when your life's on the line like that. Wow. That's amazing, man. I mean, that, that certainly grounds you to, to really just believe in the power of what you're doing. I imagine besides all the media stuff yeah. and the people that you're reaching at, when it comes down to it, to be able to save someone's life, it's, it's you know, it's funny because, uh, when I do make a video, I'm sitting usually in the room with one other person and the camera and you don't realize the impact, you know, even if you know a million people are going to watch it or, you know, 5 million people are going to watch it, you don't feel that impact right away. But perhaps I can get it if I really dive into the comments. But when you're one on one with a patient, nothing can replace that. That's why I cannot mm. let go of the clinical side of medicine. And I think both of those sort of sides to me feed each other. So because I'm in the office every day or you know, half of the week with my patients, I'm able to gauge what questions they have, what language I need to use to help them out, uh, get experience in terms of what works, what doesn't, what's practical. And then when I'm making a video and I'm doing, you know, hours of research, that also helps me with my patients to give them the best and most up-to-date information. So both really allow me to be as good on camera as I am with one-on-one -on -one with a patient. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, I know you're into stand-up comedy and I, and I listen to a lot of co comedian podcasts as well. And then when I hear yeah. them talk about them going into movies or TV shows where the reach is probably, you know, millions of people where yeah. uh, uh, it, it, but it doesn't give them that satisfaction as going into yeah. a small, you know, comedy stand-up club yeah. and interacting with even a hundred people and getting that live interaction. Uh, there's just really nothing that can replace that. Yep. We're, we're social beings as humans. We love human interaction. We need it. In fact, that's why I think, you know, COVID-19 outside of its detrimental effects as a virus has also hurt us as a civilization because it's cut off our ability to socialize. We're spending less time together with our loved ones. Some loved ones are dying alone in hospital without getting a chance to see, you know, their children for the last time. And that's, that's a very, very difficult part of this pandemic that not necessarily is undercovered because we have talked about it, but it's just something that most people don't think about. When they think about the virus, they think, you know, cough, fever, you can get into the ICU, but social isolation can be quite traumatic as well. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm fascinated about the schedule that you have of how you're able to manage all of these things that you're doing. As I mentioned, you're still practicing and you're still churning out content. It seems like you're expanding into different platforms at this point. Now you're yeah. doing interviews uh, with people like myself. You said you're going to be doing production right after we go to the interview. Yeah. I mean, how is one person with a three-person production team, by the way, <laughs> yeah. three people able to And handle... it used to be two. We just uh, hired Sam, who's an awesome Thank God. <laughs> to help us out. Uh, but we did two and a half years, almost three years, with just me and the videographer, editor, Dan Owens. So like... That's we insane, we, we did uh, up to 5 million subscribers, us too. So the reason I'm saying that is not to say, oh, look how cool it is that we've accomplished so much with so little, but it's use this as hope and as a, a proof of concept that it can be done with just two people. You don't need a mega studio budget. You can do well financially and do it responsibly and ethically and help people. Because a lot of times I feel like people think doing well financially is at odds with helping humanity and it doesn't have to be. So I, I really urge people to think outside the box and whenever they hit a roadblock, not just to say, oh, roadblock can't go any further. Think about how you can jump over that wall, go under and go through it. I think that's like a, even a Michael Jordan quote, mm. who's the goat, by the way. Great. The goat. Netflix yes. documentary slash ESPN doc, if you've seen it. Yes. The last dance. Oh, my God. Um, and so <laughs> how does your week look? I mean, br break down your week for me. You know, is, is it... Uh, yeah. While you're still able to practice, uh, are you able to choose your hours of when you go into into the office or not the office, but you know the uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it is the office. I mean, uh, it's attached to the hospital, but I'm in a primary care outpatient setting, um, and I have set hours that I work in the hospital, and then well, when I say hospital, I mean in the, in the office setting, and then I also because of my flexibility of filming, I also offer. My practice that if someone calls out, if they need help, if you know they're short staffed, call me and I come in. So I sort of act as a free agent helping fill gaps in coverage. 
Um, a lot of times I'll also precept residents, which are young doctors in training. So they would see patients and if there's a complex issue, they would reach out to me for help. I'll review their notes, make sure everything done is, cor- is done correctly, uh, teach them some procedures. So I, I do teaching. Uh, I see patients, sometimes urgent care, sometimes primary care. But that's the beauty of what I do. It's constantly shifting, constantly adapting, and it never gets boring because of it. And while my week is basically I work seven days a week, that sounds scary, but there's also times where I can just say, you know what? I need from you know 2 p.m. on tonight just for myself, for my mental well-being. And I can do it because I'm sort of – the team is small. I'm in charge of everything. And if I'm willing to – you know save my mental health for today. I'm going to focus tomorrow really hard and use a full day and catch up on whatever it is I missed. And I think you have to be able to be kind to yourself like that, especially when you're taking on so many different tasks. Dude, I I don't know what your magic sauce is, but I have friends of mine that are literally sitting on their couches that are way more tired than you are working seven days a week, (laughs) running your production, doing interviews like podcasting, creating your content. I I don't know how you do it. It's, It's just insane to me. Yeah. And there's so many things happening behind the scenes that folks aren't even aware of. Like we're going to be launching a cool new project with the the community. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Patreon. We're going to be launching a Patreon soon uh, for $10 a month, basically creating a community of like-minded individuals who want to get accurate health info, want to participate in the process. You're going to get some unique benefits. But the whole purpose of this $10 a month is not for me to raise money. I'm doing well myself. I don't need the money. i rather do something meaningful with it. And what we decided to do is every month, everyone as part of the Patreon gets a vote where that money goes each month. Mm. And our goal, and we're kind of hopeful, I think it's a reasonable goal to get 10,000 people to sign up, which would mean every month would be given around $100,000 to the charity of my community's choice. And I think to have that sort of impact on the world simply because of social media is amazing. And we're constantly thinking of new ways to do this, uh, to put out more information out there, to challenge misinformation, partnering with large organizations, be it the UN, a uh, major health institution like uh, Atlantic Health System. We're continually thinking outside the box, even trying to figure out the TV space. And we've gotten really close a handful of times, but because of my integrity and lack of compromise of my ethics, those deals have fallen apart in the past. And Can you give specifics? Uh, I mean, specifics is just like I. I have went through this entire education process to tell people the truth. And when sponsors get control of that message, I think the whole mission is compromised. And, you know, some people believe that in order to run a TV show or a program, they need, you know, full run of sponsorship money, full flexibility. And I've proved on my social media that you can do sponsorships, you can do advertisements, but do them ethically, smart, honest, just open so that everyone knows what's going on and it's transparent. Because when you have transparency, you have accountability. And I don't feel like a lot of the TV programs currently do that. That's why you've seen a lot of the major uh, medical figures get in trouble, go before Congress, have to testify why they're making these claims. And I will not compromise my integrity in order to do that. I I can honestly say I've turned down several seven-figure deals for some major projects simply because like, I want to tell people the truth. Uh, it's not worth having money and not being able to rest my uh, head comfortably on a pillow at night. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting to see the difference in terms of the messaging and kind of the, uh, I mean, so we actually had Dr. Drew on last week and he's obviously one of the pioneers amongst amongst the many guys of that course. really risen and was on radio, TV, all these different things, yeah. but I do sense like a difference in terms of how you guys talk about how you want to resonate and how you want to build your brand. Like it's something that's so central and core to you in terms of being transparent and having that direct relationship with your audience. And partly not to fault Dr. Drew or any of these guys, I, I think it's just because the way they've risen to the top is to always have a production yeah. team or a studio that was in the middle of sponsors and all these different things. So wasn't that direct relationship that you have now, like you jumping into the comments on YouTube and directly talking to someone. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's, it's just a generational gap that uh, they haven't sort of switched to. And I think as my viewers are going to get older, just like I'm going to get older, they're going to have to rely on my information even more because, you know, as we get older, unfortunately more health issues come up, the longer you're alive, the more likely, you know, to get sick with at least some sort of illness and you're going to want accurate advice. And I want to be there for those individuals because 
I, I know that when I look online, I'm confused and I have to do my own deep research to figure out what's what. I hear my patients be confused, my family members. I mean, even staff of the hospital be confused. So I want to be that voice that people understand that when they're coming to my channel, they're hearing me speak uh, on you know your podcast, your show, they understand that they're getting the unfiltered truth and the reasoning as to why I'm saying those things. So a lot of people believe expert opinion is like the end all be all. And I really have humbled myself into understanding that expert opinion is really crap. It's like the lowest form of evidence that we have. And sometimes we need to rely on it because we have no other data. But many times, when, especially when expert opinion goes against existing good quality evidence, that's when I really get disappointed in some of my medical colleagues because you know whether it's political gain, cognitive biases, whatever it's causing them to make these decisions, it's disappointing to see because they're sort of going back on their oath that they took as physicians. Mm. Dude, unfiltered truth. That's like a good podcast or, or like a segment name for you, huh? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love that because it's, that's what we do. I mean, you know, you think my YouTube channel, a lot of it is memes, doctor reaction shows. We've talked about gender bias, racial bias in healthcare. Um, we recently talked about a controversial study that was quite sexist, targeting my female colleagues. Mm. Um, there's just, we t like any political uh, misinformation that comes as a result of a pandemic like this, M media failing us horribly over the last year in giving us accurate info without causing panic. And sort of my voice has really read. I mean, for the New York Times to call a young doctor one of the most reliable sources on YouTube, which is the first or second most visited website on, in the world, is crazy. Wow. And it's on one hand disappointing that someone isn't doing this better than me, but since they're not, I feel like we have to fill that void in and really come in there and give people the accurate info they need. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that definitely seems core to your message and, and what you're doing. Um, and and the and the interesting thing about the work that you do is is that ability to reach millions of people through the production that you do and the content creation, but then also have that one-on-one -on -one interaction with patients. Now, when you have that amount of influence and impact, when you're giving out such perhaps, you know, vital and, and sometimes sensitive information in terms of health and, and how much it could impact people. Do you have to, uh, do you have to vary the lines of what you can tell someone in person versus the millions of people that would see your message? Do you have to stay more on the safe side? Do you feel, do you feel yourself like filtering yourself a little bit because of that? Um, I, it's definitely a different conversation when I'm speaking to my social media folks versus a patient, because I'm not creating a doctor patient relationship. I'm almost giving lectures right. uh, in a very ed entertaining way. So they don't even feel like they're being lectured or learning something, but I'm presenting general information for them to sort of take that and then apply it to themselves as individuals. And even when I answer a question, uh, cause I do a, a segment where I respond to comments, I always answer it in the most sort of general way. Basically, if someone asks a question about their diabetes control, I explain what a diabetic visit would look like in my practice, what things I would take into consideration, uh, what would a physical exam focus on, what blood work I may order, um, and if they need to see a specialist or not, and what would guide my decision whether or not they need to see a specialist. And with that information, not only can that viewer, but every other viewer that has a similar question about diabetes can then use that information to sort of guide their treatment or guide their um, decisions. And my piece of advice that I give almost always is if you're not sure or you want to play it safe, always contact your doctor. I am yeah. not your doctor. That, that That is always the key piece of advice because, you know, I can't possibly give someone good advice through social media. Like it just, it's not responsible. Uh, it's not going to be accurate uh, unless it's general info. Yeah, totally, totally. Well, speaking to you now, I mean, I, I actually read that you were once a fairly like a shy person coming in and, and yeah. totally understandable. I was as well, just not being able to know English. I was constantly self-conscious about what I was saying, yeah. what I wasn't saying. Uh, as someone that's now in the spotlight all the time, maybe not in front of a live audience, but nevertheless, it's, it's still something that you kind of have to overcome, right? How yeah. have you been able to gain that confidence in yourself? Like what's, I'm curious to know what your mindset is from being able to be uh, a shy immigrant kid to 
now just you know being able to speak confidently over over the camera or maybe it's behind the scenes it's a little different i don't know <laughs> <laughs> no no because I, I do plenty of uh, tv stuff as well in front of a live audience like i do yeah. rachel ray show several times kelly and ryan show that that's a live studio audience so i'm definitely doing that a lot and it, i've never had experience doing that I, I don't think i was ever particularly great at doing that but i think the two main factors that helped me with this level of success is one because you realize how life is short and how serious it can get, you learn to not stress the little things. So when you're taking care of people who are losing their loved ones or losing their lives or getting horrible news, you realize how much less being stuck in a traffic jam should upset you or how nervous you should get before an appearance because there's people that are you know, finding out the results of whether or not they're getting a kidney transplant or not. So being in that scenario oftentimes helped me sort of find the right place for my anxieties. And then the second part of that would be my dad's message. It's actually a Russian saying. It's called Chiriz Nimagu. And it means going through I can't. Almost like Nike's just do it. I guess my dad put like <laughs> the Russian spin on Before Nike was even around, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that saying in the beginning, I just, you know, I'm nervous to go on stage, but I'm just going to do it. And I would go on, do it. I might be nervous. There's definitely room for improvement. And the confidence doesn't come from the fact that I'm a confident person. The confidence comes from the fact that I've done it, survived. I may have messed up, but I've learned, I've gotten better, I've seen the improvement, and that's where the confidence comes from. So a lot of people mistake confidence, willpower as usually the first thing that needs to come before you succeed, when in reality, being uncomfortable before confidence is better. Mm. Putting in the work is what gets you willpower. So it's sort of putting the uh, gas into the car before getting the car moving. And... I've really used my dad's message of Chiris Nimagu to make all that happen. Yeah, no, I, I can definitely resonate with that. I mean, I, I have friends of mine or people that listen to the podcast that would message me in terms of how to develop the confidence, how they can stop caring what other people think. And I, I think what it really comes down to, at least it, personally, is, is that I give is number one, develop uh go through like really hard shit right and and i could be honestly yeah. like lifting weights it could be a particular experience using that as a tool to remind yourself that you can overcome things and developing like a skill set that is is respected and something that's needed in the world that creates value that allows people to give you know give you that respect that you need so that you can have the confidence to walk around uh and and know that you deserve it and uh, I think I think it's it's a it's a shame that people focus too much on their looks and resort to you know, surgery or any of these cosmetic things to gain confidence when a lot of it should be focusing on the internal aspect of things. Yeah, Sean, you're 100 percent right uh, with that message, because, you know, we've seen actually really negative effects from instilling heavy self-esteem in our younger generations before they've earned it. Uh, like the whole idea of participation trophies for everybody, that's the common example folks use. But just constantly telling every, like children that they're amazing, even when they do wrong, not instilling that discipline. I'm not saying you have to you know, be spanking your children, but the idea that you have to have boundaries. You have to teach a developing mind what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. Allow them to fail, to feel that failure, to learn how to process it. Because if you go through your childhood without ever experiencing failure because you're protected and we coddled you and we constantly put self-esteem, you get a really false sense of confidence that when you enter the real world, it's going to cause a level of anxiety and depression because you've just never dealt with it. You have no experience. It's like putting in a, a doctor to operate who's never operated on someone. That's never going to be a good outcome. So you have to allow your children to experience the world. Uh, you know, Bullying is obviously awful. But, you know, if someone said something mean to me and I came home and cried, my dad did not coddle me. I mean, obviously, if it became a chronic abusive pattern, then he would step in. But the fact that someone said something mean should not be a cause for me to destroy my day or for not being able to function at school, because those things are going to happen into your adulthood and you have to learn how to deal with it, self-soothe. It, it's part of the process of being human. And the fact that people rely heavily on, like you said, 
superficial levels of happiness, whether it's cosmetic surgery, money, status symbols like cars or homes, those types of extrinsic happiness are not fulfilling. Long term, they will not give you the joy and fulfillment that you want out of life. And they're only temporary pleasures that are going to keep you on a treadmill where you think you're going to the next level. But then when you just realize it, it's going to fall off and you adapt because that's what the human mind does so well. Yeah, man, I, I totally resonate with that. I mean, it, 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 I think it, it goes beyond looks. It could probably go for financial status as well. And, and maybe it's different in New York, but I, I know that there's a, I think it's a psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, who was commenting, uh, he did a research or study that once you make $75,000 and more, your level of happiness starts to diminish. And maybe that's a little bit different with, with inflation, but yeah, it really just goes to say, I mean, it's, it's, it's not necessarily what you make or what's the, what's the number of zeros in your bank account, but it's, it comes, it comes down to the in, intrinsic happiness for sure. For sure. Yeah. And I think what's most exciting about that, because some people say that here, then they get maybe upset by it, but I think it, it goes to show that you have complete control over your happiness. And I think humans get a lot of anxiety and worry when they don't have control over a given scenario. So to know that we're in control of our own happiness, we're in control over whether or not we enjoy our day or whether or not someone's words upset us, that should be empowering uh, because you get to you know, essentially create your own destiny. As cheesy as that sounds. <laughs> yeah, man. No, for sure. For sure. I mean, I, I'm not saying this for myself either. I mean, I, I remember living in Argentina in Buenos Aires, literally having like $700, not knowing how I was going to pay my bills. But for me, the highest uh, thing that I valued most was freedom. And for some, some people, it might be different. Some people, it might be impact or sure. influence in your case. And I think it's just a matter of figuring out what that is for you and, and really going deep into what makes you happy in that sense. Easier said than done, but... Of course. No, I mean, that's, that's a big part of what I do in my practice. Uh, you know, I do a form of cognitive behavioral therapy for my patients that, uh, you know, it's very difficult sometimes for folks to get a proper counselor or psychologist, whether it's a financial issue, insurance issue, timing issue. So I'll always have like the introductory session with my patients uh, and essentially introduce them to the concept of cognitive behavioral therapy, where we take on some of these disordered thoughts that we have quite often, like all or nothing thinking, um, you know, labeling yourself. If you get a bad grade, I'm a failure. But what about all the great grades you got before? How, do, how are you a failure off one test? And challenging those irrational disordered thoughts and just replacing them with a rational thought. That alone takes away the power. I mean, it's not a cure like instantly, but it takes away the power from those thoughts to lead you down a spiral of anxiety or depression. And it gives you the control back. And it's something simple, but you know, you need someone with experience to sort of help you guide you through that process. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure you deal with people or clients that have or patients with anxiety quite often. Is there things that you do, especially, you know, during these days, is there things that yeah. you do that have helped uh, in terms of calming people down? Um, right now, what's interesting is not a lot of folks are coming in with a complaint or at least the visit reason being anxiety. I think the reason for this is if they're anxious at home, they chalk it up to the virus or they say, oh, not worth risking potentially getting sick and going into a medical facility to have that happen, which by the way, probably not great thinking because anxiety, depression, all those are true problems. And we've made our offices and hospitals really safe. In fact, that's why in the beginning we recommended folks not come so we can secure the areas, figure out protocols to make sure people aren't crossing in the hallways. So we have like one way moving traffic, masks, all these policies in place. So I do want folks to not have that deter them. But what they do come in for is a lot of physical manifestations that they don't even realize are caused by anxiety. So the neck pains, the shoulder pains, the back pains, the palpitations of the heart, where they think they're having a physical problem, and when in reality, they're having a physical symptom as a result of their anxiety. And the more that we do tests and we do a proper physical exam and we rule out major anatomical issues, physical issues, we realize anxiety is playing a huge role here. And I'm seeing anxiety being the cause of a lot, a lot of physical complaints for my patients. So... Part of that is reassuring them that physically nothing is wrong in the given moment. And the second part of that is allowing them to address what they're feeling. Because 
to function well in society, sometimes you have to repress your feelings. Like you can't be at work crying all the time, even if you truly are sad, because it's very difficult to get work done that way. But you can't then come home and also repress your feelings there, because then that starts this vicious cycle where you're not really ever in touch with your emotions. And the way that your body lets it out is through physical manifestations of an injury, high blood pressure, poor sleep, all of these things. And I help my patients sort of connect with these thoughts ask them genuine questions about what they're going through and help them replace some of those irrational, disordered thoughts with rational ones. And sometimes it's a single session and it helps them get back on track. Sometimes it's bibliotherapy, which is recommending them a great handbook or personal guide of something to read. Um, There's a great book called Feeling Good that allows Mm -hmm. patients to sort of figure out how they can use cognitive behavioral therapy on themselves with a handbook. There's also a great book I recommend to a lot of my patients called The Divided Mind. It talks about how repressing your emotions can cause physical symptoms. And this was written by Dr. Sarno from NYU, who just passed not too long ago. Uh, He's a physical medicine rehabilitation doctor. He's not a psychologist, but he saw the link and he saw that there were patients that were having physical, true physical ailments. This was not happening in their minds, but it was happening as a result of what was going on in their minds. And once it was addressed, he saw great outcomes. And I think that when patients read it, they can see others going through it, perhaps attend a group meeting or two. It makes a huge difference in their lives. And the best part of it, there's no medication. There's mm. no like expensive treatments for this. It's really just about connecting and being honest with yourself. Yeah, this is one thing I want to talk to you about is, is, is I think in this world of chaos, I think more people are leading to medication more than ever and there are oftentimes the thing that i the thing that i've always feared i want to get your opinion on is is you know if someone can't sleep they'll take a sleeping pill and that has side effects of certain other kinds and they'll take another pill to to uh to suppress that side effect and it's kind of this cycle it seems where they're always looking for the next pill to solve their issues and certain pills are okay but i've always thought trying to go natural was the best route, but I wanted to get your thoughts on how people can navigate through this. Yeah, it's the short answer is it's always an individual decision. What works for me may not work for you and might not work for the next patient down the line. So there's never a one size fits all solution when it comes to medications. That being said, I can confidently say we're over prescribing medicines in the United States. Reasons for that are quite murky though. They're not as simple as doctors being pill pushers. I know that's the common you know, thought that people have, you know, big pharma's pushing doctors to write more prescriptions. And while there's definitely partial truth to that, there's also a a truth to patients coming in and requesting quick solutions to complex problems. And doctors are sort of at the mercy of their patients of getting a good review, making sure the patient leaves a good satisfaction score, not, you know, destroying their business on Yelp or, uh, you know, Google reviews, because at the end of the day, if a patient writes a negative review on Yelp, doctor can't come in and say, hey, you're my patient and the reason I treated you with this because they have patient privacy. So you're mm-hmm. essentially at the mercy of a lot of these review websites. And it's a unique problem that hasn't really been addressed properly. But equally as much as doctors probably overprescribe medicines, patients are also asking for medicines. And a lot of times I wanna tell them that this isn't ideal and I'll try to explain to them why it's not ideal. Many times it's not sufficient. They want, they believe that there is a cure-all pill for their problem. And the truth of the matter is there isn't simply because we don't know enough about medicine. We're advanced technologically more than we've ever been, but we still don't know so much about the human body. And the human body is a tricky thing. It sometimes doesn't follow rational thinking. Sometimes you think, oh, if we're short on this hormone, we'll just put more of the hormone. And then you put in more of the hormone and the body's like, oh, we're now just going to cut down on the receptors for this hormone. And you're like, wait, I thought I would have solved this problem. And it, it takes really years, decades of hardcore study, even to figure out a small issue, like what happens to a receptor as opposed to how to cure depression or anxiety. And the treatments that we have, we still don't even know how they work. Mm. Like, How crazy is that? Like, these medicines that we prescribe as antidepressants, they're certainly needed. There's groups of populations that absolutely get benefit from them. And if your doctor recommends them, there could be a really good reason why they're doing it. But that being said, we don't know exactly how they work. We have theories and we have certain thoughts behind how they work, but we're still figuring it out. And the more I could tell people 
that doctors have this level of humility, that we don't have all the answers. Hopefully they'll request less and less of these medications so that they don't have to rely on them. Because as humans, you don't want to rely on a medicine unless you absolutely need it. And I think what I would love to see my patients do more, and this is something I do, and perhaps I'm in a privileged place because I'm well off financially now, and it wouldn't have made sense when I was you know, hustling or my dad needed to be in the hospital or you know, our family doesn't eat. But if I don't sleep well one night, it's really easy to go and reach for a pill. And I would sleep well with that pill. However, there's value in taking that loss and not sleeping well that night and then catching up on sleep the following night so you appreciate what a deep sleep feels like. To know that you know some nights are going to suck and that you're going to have to battle through it. And it sort of really equalizes you with your highs and lows. Because if every time you feel unhappy, you take a pill, every time you're head hurts, you take a pill. Every time you can't sleep, you take a pill. All of a sudden, your equilibrium between what's good and bad starts getting really twisted, where now the good things that happen to you aren't so good anymore. Mm. So I do encourage my patients to, your back hurts? Well, guess what? Like, no bed rest. I want you to keep moving. In fact, it'll heal better when you keep moving. And when they stand up and they stand up so gingerly because they don't want to have it hurt so much, I tell them, don't guard it. Because you're not going to do gigantic damage from standing up. I already checked you. There's no neurological issue. I'm obviously giving a hypothetical here, but I tell them not to guard because when they guard, they actually create more tension. They train their mind to sense the pain as opposed to get past the pain. And there's so many of these times where patients want that quick fix, the medicine to make it go away doesn't always exist. In fact, the majority of the time it doesn't exist. Um, so I want to close it off with asking you some rapid fire health questions uh, cool. One thing that really caught my attention, because I'm like a big supplement person. Well, Any I'm curious. Sense, what do you so. take? This is cool. Well, okay, okay, so let's go through it. And you know what? I'm going to bring it out. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> okay, cool. I like this. I literally have like eight or nine. Wow. I mix okay. these. So you have a lot of supplements. I have a lot, man. And I spent a lot of money. So I'm like, all right, Dr. Mike, <laughs> can you save me? $150 a month because this is getting ridiculous. I was like, Well, what? I'm going to have to give you that prerequisite that we talked about earlier that I'm not going to be giving you individual advice. I'm not going right. to become your doctor here, but I will give you general thoughts on each yes. supplement. Keep in mind, okay, I'm 27 years old, relatively healthy, no illnesses, no COVID. Okay. All right. Okay. So and what, what are your goals? What are you looking to do with these supplements? I'm honestly trying to maintain energy because I'm running multiple businesses, I have podcasts, not as crazy as you, but it's it's something that I, I wanna make sure I'm constantly energized and fully alert mentally. Um, okay. And obviously just prolong health. So, Fair. vitamin D, I'll remove the branding. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's <Mostly> this sponsor? <laughs> um, we got fish oil, uh, although I heard krill oil is, is, is ideal, I might tr switch that. Uh, probiotics, and I also mixed in vitamin C in there, just because I want to pack light. Uh, vitamin B, I know this is a big one in your video, and biotin. Okay. Because I don't want to get specifically bald. the biotin, just because it was the last <laughs> one. Uh, yeah. Are you? What's your reasoning? Is it the hair, skin, and nails conversation? But yeah, I just don't want to get bald. Um, okay. So that was like a big one, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> to be honest. So yeah. let's start with biotin because that's like an easy one and a very popular one that people, especially on social media, take. Um, biotin deficiency, meaning that an individual for you to be deficient in biotin is quite rare. Uh, and it's true that if you are one of those rare individuals who has biotin deficiency, you will have more fragile hair, you'll lose hair, but that is a very rare phenomenon. Mm -hmm. and the danger in general of supplements is that they're not regulated by the FDA. Like right now, I can sit here, put whatever I want into capsules, slap Dr. Mike's miracle stuff on it and sell it in a store, and it's perfectly legal. To me, that's really problematic. Um, and then with biotin, an interesting study came out that showed if you're taking high enough doses of it, which most of these companies are putting in really high doses of biotin, it actually will block the markers that we look and check for, for heart damage when someone's having a heart attack. Oh shit. And if you think about who's taking biotin, uh, a lot of my female patients, ages 50, 60, they want to you know, take a supplement for their hair, they take biotin, they come in, they're having some acid reflux, we do an EKG, it looks non-conclusive and I'll order this blood test 
And I always have to make sure that we need to ask if they're taking biotin because they could actually hide the result of that test. And that's just like one example of something that we found that these supplements can be really misguiding our health decisions without any real provable benefit. Like if you're an average healthy person and you take biotin, will you see improvements to your hair? Probably not. All right. That's $30 a month that you're just about to save me <laughs> out the door. No, I don't want to misguide you because what if you're the individual who has biotin deficiency and I didn't do a thorough history on you? So don't All use right. this to make any decision. All right. This is just for me. This is just for me. Don't worry. Okay. I'll be fine. Um, all right, vitamin, or let's say, I think the next one was vitamin D, right? That you gave? Okay, video? Vitamin, yeah, vitamin D is like a popular one, especially in media. I mean, we've seen stories cover everything from having low vitamin D levels to increases in cancer, to obesity, uh, heart disease. I mean, they've correlated it to everything. And while those correlations are absolutely true, uh, it really is the chicken or the egg scenario. So is it that you have low vitamin D and as a result, you're developing all these illnesses or because you're developing all these illnesses, you're therefore getting a low vitamin D level? We don't have an answer to that question. We also haven't seen the evidence that if you have, a, let's say, borderline or slightly low vitamin D and you supplement, does it cure your heart disease? Does it lower your risk of diabetes? No, we haven't seen that play out. What we have seen is those who have a very low number, like a vitamin D level of 10, and they supplement they do see benefit for those rare individuals who have a level 10. And, you know, in some areas, if you're completely indoors, maybe it makes sense to take a supplement. It's worth discussing with your doctor. But to me, the issue with vitamin D is the way that it's promoted by the marketing companies and by a lot of physicians, they almost say it as like a universal piece of advice. Hey, everyone should take this. And that's not true. There's a certain population that may get a benefit. There's a certain population that may get a harm from it, especially if they take it in high dosages. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, meaning that you don't just pee it out like you do with vitamin C, for example. It actually can build up in your fat stores throughout your body and become toxic. So wow. there's wow. true uh, harms that come from taking some of these supplements, and they need to be regulated. You need to be really smart with why you're taking them. Again, if you're just taking a mild, small supplement, really, unless you're taking it from an unsuitable company, you'll be fine. But it's something I instill with my patients. Like if you could put that effort instead of making sure you take your vitamin D every day into a healthier sleep schedule, into a healthier meditation or mindfulness exercise, I would much rather you put it there because the evidence for those mm. things is that much stronger, even though it takes more effort. And it's the summertime. So you got the sun so that pretty much saves $25 a month. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last one. Um, Last one I want to do is probiotics. This is something that's okay. new in my subscription. I want to know what your thoughts are on with probiotics. Yeah, so probiotics uh, certainly have a, a role in healthcare. Uh, we've seen very specific healthcare conditions that do receive some benefit from probiotics, from probiotics that are actually effective. Because there's some companies that sell a probiotic that by the time it reaches your home, all the organisms, which are the good bacteria inside the probiotics, actually die off and now you're just taking an empty capsule. Wow. So if you're taking a good quality one, one that's stored properly, transported properly, you there's instances where I prescribe it to my patients. Uh, an example would be in those who have traveler's diarrhea, in those who have um, antibiotic-associated diarrhea. I actually recommend those who take antibiotics to usually take a probiotic with it or perhaps a probiotic-rich food. Um, and also there's very specific conditions in children that your viewers probably don't even need to get worried about, but there's also some preliminary evidence for, um, inflammatory bowel disease, but really a lot of that is new evidence and it's unclear how much benefit we get. Generally, it's a low risk option that we do try in many of our patients, but know that the evidence isn't perfect. And then the claims that are most out there, I'm actually going to cover one of them in, in this video I'm filming right after this, is probiotics for weight loss. Hmm. And what we've seen is those who have a healthier weight generally have a more diverse gut bacteria, meaning different types of bacteria, and they have more of what we call the good bacteria, the probiotics. Again, chicken before the egg. We don't know if they had those and they're healthy. And then the people who are overweight or obese or morbidly obese, are those individuals eating unhealthy and then their gut microbiome changes? We don't know. 
And another thing we don't know is we haven't at least seen the evidence for is if you take someone who's severely overweight and you give them the supplement and you compare them to a group who's also thinking they're taking the supplement and you do this randomized controlled study, we haven't seen them lose weight simply off that one variable. Because weight loss is a complex issue. It's not as simple as one pill. It's almost yeah. never going to be as simple as one pill. Despite what you see on YouTube and Instagram. Exactly. I mean, well, because look, the way that social media algorithms, and they sort of feed into this misinformation paradigm is that the most extreme or exciting claims are the ones that are getting clicked. Therefore, the algorithm keeps pushing them and they get the most views. Um, so what I've tried to do is to make the buzziest type of content, but maintaining the ethics and the integrity of the videos so I can compete as counter accurate information to those inaccurate claims. Beauty. So is there any supplement that you recommend people take or is it all really individualized? Is there, is there something that you can take on a daily basis that's just generally good with, with not a lot of downsides? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, if you're an average healthy person, it's rare that you'll need something extra. And this is also keeping in mind what your diet's like. I mean, you know, some of my patients eat a really poor diet and in those situations, perhaps there's some benefit to getting a multivitamin in there. And that's mm. really as far as I would go. But I would try and instead of focusing on the vitamin, because a lot of times they use that as like a safety blanket, thinking, oh, I'll take this multivitamin and I'm fine. I would try my best or at least figure out what the barriers are to getting them to eat healthy, to figure out uh, perhaps a weight loss regimen or an exercise plan, a sleep routine. Because honestly, if you're talking about it, like you, you want to optimize your health, you want to have more energy levels, we can have a conversation that is so much more evidence-based, meaning that you're actually gonna get results from, just by talking about the simple things you do day in and day out, more so than what's on your counter right now. Mm. Dude, this is amazing. You just saved me like $150 a month. So <laughs> yeah, but I feel like I should I'm, pay you for this interview. Other things you have to do <laughs> because now, you know, you have to make sure you're sleeping seven to nine hours a night consistently. Yeah. And when you're not, you have to suffer and maybe not to get a great night's sleep. And, you know, it's life's funny. It's it's tricky. It's constantly changing. And the, the bottom line that I want to leave your listeners and viewers with is doctors don't have all the answers. Uh, be skeptical of doctors that are I know all experts that claim to have all the answers because medicine is ever changing. I'm sure you've heard examples of doctors say coffee causes pancreatic cancer. And now we're saying that it extends life. So clearly mm. the evidence is imperfect. And the more I can, as a healthcare facilitator, uh, communicator, put that out and say how, you know, this is imperfect, but here's what we do know. Here's where our confidence level lies. Hopefully people can make the best decisions for themselves. I, I want to make sure that you can find Dr. Mike uh, on YouTube. Where, where can, what's the best pe place that people can take you? If you just type in Dr. Mike in YouTube, Facebook, anywhere, uh, I'll be the only one that pops up. Luckily, the social media algorithms do a Sucks great job. for the other Dr. Mike. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for every Dr. Mike that I never has. thought about it that way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You're putting a great work, man. All right, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you, Dr. Mike, for joining us. And we'll see you guys next week.